Chapter Six of Molly's Prince. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Riley. Molly's Prince by Rosa Nouche Carey. Chapter Six Queen Elizabeth's Wraith. Life indeed must always be a compromise between common sense and the ideal, the one abating nothing of its demands, the other accommodating itself to what is practicable and real. Amiel. As they entered the large square hall with fuss and fury frolicking round them, a tall, respectable-looking woman came forward to meet them. "'I suppose my sister is in the library, Mitchell?' asked Miss Harford quickly. "'Yes, ma'am. Parker has just taken in the tea. "'Then will you please give this young lady some? "'Take her into my room and make her comfortable. "'I must ask you to excuse me for a short time, Miss Ward, "'as I have to talk over one or two things with my sister, "'but Mitchell will look after you.' "'Oh, please, do not trouble about me,' returned Waveney. "'And then she followed Mitchell down a long passage "'full of beautiful plants,' to a pleasant sitting-room with a deep bay window overlooking the lawn with the sundial. The peacock was strutting across the grass with the mincing, ambling gait peculiar to that bird, the peahen following him more meekly. Through green trellised arches one looked on a tennis lawn, and beyond that was a large red brick cottage with a porch. When Mitchell brought in the tea tray, Waveney asked her who lived there. The woman looked a little amused at the question. "'No one lives there, ma'am,' she answered civilly. "'My mistresses built it for their winter evening entertainments. There is only one room, with a sort of kitchen behind it. It is always called the porch house.' Waveney longed to ask some more questions, but Mitchell had already retired, so she sat down and enjoyed her tea. How happy she could be in this lovely place if only Molly were with her! And then she thought of the fifty pounds a year. After all, Erpingham was not so far away. Perhaps they would let her go home once a week. If she could only have her Sunday afternoons and evenings to herself. And then her heart began to beat quickly. How delicious that would be! How Molly and she would talk! and after tea they would sing their old hymns, and then they would all go to church together, and her father and Noel would walk to the station to see her off, and then she wondered if she should mind the long walk across the common. It would be rather lonely, she thought, on a dark winter's evening, and perhaps Miss Harford would not approve of it. While Waveney indulged in these surmises and cogitations, Miss Harford had walked briskly across the inner hall, and, tapping lightly at a door, opened it and entered a beautiful long room fitted up as a library. It had a grand oriel window with a cushioned seat and a tiny inner room like a recess with a glass door leading to the lawn with the cedar tree. A lady writing at the table in the centre of the room uttered a little exclamation of surprise. "'Why, Doreen, I was just writing to you, "'but it is the unexpected that always happens.' "'And then the two sisters kissed each other affectionately. "'You can put away your letter and give me some tea instead,' "'said Doreen, laughing, "'and then Althea smiled and walked to a little tea-table "'that had been placed in the window "'with two inviting-looking easy-chairs beside it. "'Sit down, Dory, do,' and tell me what has brought you over like a flash of lightning on a summer evening, she said as she took up the teapot. Althea Harford was a better-looking woman than her sister, but she could never have been handsome. She was very tall, and her figure was decidedly graceful. She walked well, and carried her head with the air of an empress. Her eyes were expressive and even beautiful, but her face was too long and thin and her reddish auburn hair and light eyelashes gave her rather a colourless look. 
she had a long aquiline nose and some people said that she reminded them of queen elizabeth though it may be doubted whether that tudor princess had althea's air of refinement and gentleness she was evidently a year or two younger than her sister but her dress like doreen's was very sedate and suitable to her age she had a style of her own which certainly suited her when excited or under the influence of some strong emotion a faint pink color would come to her cheeks and a vivid light to her eyes at such moments she would be almost beautiful the sisters were very unlike in disposition but in spite of their dissimilarity they were the best of friends and understood each other perfectly doreen took life more lightly she had a robust cheerfulness that seldom failed her althea had a greater sense of humor and far more intellect but there was a veiled melancholy about her as though early in life she had suffered disillusion and she would speak sometimes as though human existence were a comedy where the players wore masks and performed the shadow dance at intervals both sisters were ladies bountiful and gave nobly of their substance but althea could never be brought to acknowledge that she gave enough she had scruples of conscience and would sometimes complain that they were like dives and had their good things in this life and as though we were not rich enough she would grumble aunt sarah is actually going to leave us her money for mrs mainwaring had lately made another will in her niece's favor doreen would have a large sum of money but althea who was her favorite would be the chief legatee and althea had groaned in spirit when she heard it it is such a responsibility she sighed but doreen would not listen to this it is such an enjoyment she retorted i do so love spending money and so do you althea in spite of your grumbling and as to aunt sarah's will we need not make ourselves miserable about that for she will probably live until she is ninety and this view of the case cheered althea greatly althea's temperament was by no means pessimistic but like all deep thinkers she had to pay the penalty of her own acute perceptions the unsolved problems of life saddened her and at times disturbed her comfort she envied doreen her capacity for putting troublesome questions out of her mind i wish i had your mind dory she once said it is such a comfortable nicely padded mind when disagreeable things happen you just let down your curtains and keep yourself snug upon my word althea returned doreen good-humouredly i am glad no one but myself heard that speech you make me out a nice selfish sort of person no no you are not selfish at all you are far more ready to help people than i am you are a good woman doreen and you know i did not mean that then what did your riddle mean well just what i said that you never worry and fret yourself over troublesome questions social questions i mean difficult problems that meet one in this world at every corner i often make myself quite unhappy over them and go to bed with a heartache but i do not believe that you ever lose an hour's sleep over them i dare say not in that sense i suppose i have a nicely padded mind but althea it is not that i do not realize the difficulty but my dear child what is the good of sitting down before a mountain and waiting for it to open earthquakes of that sort won't happen i put it by until i am grown up and as althea stared at her she nodded her head quite grown up i mean we are only children here and we are not likely to get all our lessons perfect and then in a low voice she said a little solemnly what i do thou knowest not now but thou shalt know hereafter and as doreen said this her plain homely features were transfigured and althea looked at her with reverence 
for in her simple faith Doreen had passed her and taken the higher place. "'Well, Doreen, what has brought you over this evening?' asked Althea, as she handed her sister a cup of tea. "'I was thinking of driving over tomorrow to see you and Aunt Sarah. "'Well, I wanted to see you about two or three things, Miss Ward amongst them. "'I have brought her over, and she is at present partaking of tea and cake in my room.' "'Oh, do you think she will do?' asked Althea quickly. "'Well, that is for you to decide. "'You shall see her presently and judge for yourself. "'At first sight, I confess that I was not favorably impressed. "'She is such a childish-looking little thing, "'with fluffy, babyish hair curling over her head. "'But for her eyes and expression, "'I should never have thought her grown up. "'She is rather like Laura Ridgway, only paler. "'Laura has very pretty eyes, Doreen.' so has Miss Ward. They are quite out of the common. Aunt Sarah took rather a fancy to her. Aunt Sarah is a very good judge of character, her sister observed. Well, I liked her better myself after a time. Her voice is deep, but I somehow admire it, and she read very nicely. She seems anxious to come to us. They are evidently rather poor. But, here Doreen hesitated, in rather an embarrassed way. Out with it, Dory, there is something behind, I see. Well, it is for you to judge. I shall leave the decision in your hands. I think Aunt Sarah is right, and that Miss Ward is a nice little thing, but she is Everard Ward's daughter. Althea started. She was evidently quite unprepared for this. She changed color slightly. Are you sure of that, Doreen? she asked in a low voice. You know how many wards there are, dozens and dozens. Yes, and I never for a moment imagined that it could be Everard's daughter, but directly she mentioned her address, Cleveland Terrace, Chelsea. Of course I recognized her. Wait a minute, as Althea seemed inclined to interrupt her. Let me make it all clear to you. I put the question to her, is Everard Ward your father? That was plain enough, was it not? And when she said yes, I managed to glean two or three particulars that we already know. Yes, but tell me all the same, and Althea's manner was a little eager. Well, she told me that her mother was dead, we knew that, and that she had a twin sister who was rather lame, and a brother, Noel. Then, at the mention of Noel's name, Althea looked a little amused. "'What a strange coincidence,' she murmured. "'Strange enough, but rather embarrassing. Miss Ward was very naive and frank. It seems the poor man cannot sell his pictures. He has one on hand now. King Canute, she called it, and none of the dealers will look at it. She says her father is very low about it, and that they want the money badly.' Well, now what, Althea? Pretending to frown at her, for Althea's face was suffused with color, and her eyes were very bright. Poor Everard, she said softly. There is room for another picture in the porch house. And then a queer little smile came to her lips. It will be a valuable lesson to the girls. Then Doreen shook her head at her. It could not be done, you foolish woman you would be found out. We must discover another way, then, returned Althea, who was quite in earnest. Perhaps Thorold will give it a house-room. But you must be prudent, dear. I will be discretion itself. The picture will not be purchased in my name. You can depend on that. I begin to think my nature is not straightforward. I do so love little plots and underhand schemes." I should have made a good secret conspirator. Now, about this girl, if she pleases me, I can see no objection to our engaging her. It is perfectly simple, Dory. They are poor, and the girls have to work. Fate, or rather, for it is no joking matter, Providence has brought her to us. Is it too superstitious to say that I feel 
that I dare not refuse to take her? It may be another way of helping them. Yes, but in my opinion, Everard ought to know to whom he is sending her. Ah, I agree with you there, in spite of my subterranean and complicated schemes. I did not propose any fresh masquerade, as far as the girl is concerned. I am willing to be as open as the day. Now, as we have finished tea, shall I go to your room? And Doreen smiled assent. Waveney was standing by the window, crumbling some sweet cake for the peacock. She turned round at the sound of the opening door. The evening sun was shining into the room, and perhaps the light dazzled Waveney a little, but certainly she gave a very droll description of Althea to Molly afterwards. The door opened, and a very tall woman in a grey gown seemed to glide in, for she walked so quietly that I could not hear a footstep, and lo and behold, it was Queen Elizabeth's wraith. Oh, Waveney, what nonsense! And I do hate that horrid old Elizabeth. Well, so do I, but all the same, Miss Harford is remarkably like her, such a long, thin face and nose, and reddish hair, and she had a sort of ruff of lace round her throat, and such a stately manner, it was quite queenly. And, I think, really, that I should have made my curtsy, only she came up to me in the kindest way and took my hand. I am so sorry that you have been all alone all this time, she said in such a sweet voice, but my sister and I had so much business to discuss. She has told me all about you, so I am not going to trouble you with needless questions. You can just tell me anything you like about yourself. I have a great respect for workers, and always love to help them. It was nice of her to say that. Yes, it quite won my heart. I like both the Miss Harfords, Molly, but Miss Althea, or Queen Bess, as I prefer to call her, is more to my taste. She interested me directly, and we had such a nice talk, just as though we were old friends, and she said at once that I could have my Sunday afternoons. Think of that, sweetheart. I shall be with you every Sunday." Althea's sympathetic nature had at once grasped the girl's trouble at leaving home. "'I think I could arrange for you to spend the greater part of your Sundays at home,' she observed. "'That is, if you are a good walker, for we never use our horses on Sundays, unless the weather is very bad. We dine early, for I always have a busy afternoon in the porch house, and I could spare you easily.' "'But the long walk back in the dark,' faltered Waveney, who knew well that her father would make objections to this. Then Althea considered the point. "'Yes, you are right. You could not walk alone on dark evenings, and the winter is coming. There are houses, of course, but they stand so far back, and the gates are locked. "'Oh, no, my dear, that would never do.' neither my sister nor I could permit you to walk alone. Then her face brightened, and she continued with more animation. I have an idea. My maid Peachy always goes to see her mother on Sunday afternoons. She lives near Victoria, and she always takes the same train back. We will find out which that is, and then you can walk up the hill together. At this the girl's joy was so evident that Althea had been quite touched. Just at the close of the interview, she had said a few words that greatly surprised Waveney. And now, my dear, I should like you to go home and talk things over with your people, and then you can write me a line saying whether you wish to come to us. We must not decide things finally until your father gives his consent. He will know our names. And as Waveney seemed puzzled at this, when we were young, he visited at our house. Oh, not here. We lived in Surrey, then. But when shall you want me? asked Waveney, anxiously. Oh, I am sure father will give his consent. He is dreadfully unhappy at the idea of our working, but he knows it must be done. Still, you must consult him. 
returned Althea, gently, and her manner was a little stately. As for my wanting you, I shall be content if you could come to me in about ten days. Now I hear the carriage coming round. Good-bye. I think I will add au revoir. And then she shook hands very cordially, and the next moment Doreen joined them. There was very little conversation during the drive back. Miss Harford was busy with her letters and notebook, and Waveney leaned back on the cushions and thought over her talk with Althea. How strange that father should have known them, she said to herself. He often talks of his old friends, but he has never mentioned their name. Harford, no, I am sure I never heard it until Miss Warburton spoke of them. If I go anywhere, it shall be to the Red House. I have made up my mind to that. I like both of them. They are different somehow from other people, but I like Queen Bess far the best. End of chapter 6「7 of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org molly's prince by rosa newchette carey chapter seven a humorist and an idealist the world was very guilty of such a ballad some three ages since but i think now tis not to be found love's labours lost a merrier man within the limits of becoming mirth i never spent an hour's talk with all act two while waveney was doing her very best to make a favourable impression on the misses harford an interview of a far different character was taking place at number ten cleveland terrace molly who was conscientious and strictly truthful having been taught from childhood to abhor the very widest of white lies was trying laboriously to carry out a certain programme drawn up by waveney she was not to cry or to think of anything disagreeable and she was only to look at the clock twice in an hour and there was no need for her either to be always standing on the balcony and straining her eyes after every passer-by it was sheer waste of time and it would be far better to finish one of her pretty menu cards and molly who was docile and tractable had agreed to this it shall have a spray of golden-brown chrysanthemums she said quite cheerfully and then waveney left the house she arranged her painting-table and selected the flowers from corporal mark's nosegay but alas the best-laid schemes of mice and men gang after glay scarcely had molly wetted her brush before anne the heavy-footed came up with an inflamed face and red eyes the pain was horrible as she expressed it and was not to be borne would miss molly spare her for half an hour and she would get mr granger's young man to pull the tooth out oh yes anne certainly returned molly who was tender-hearted but when anne had withdrawn with a snorting sob she mused with some perplexity over all the ills to which maids of all work were liable anne had looked so strong when they had engaged her and yet she was always complaining of something she was addicted to heavy colds in her head and to a swollen face sometimes diversified by an earache she was a good-tempered willing creature but her infirmities were great and more than once waveney had advised molly to send her away but she is so honest molly would plead and she is so devoted to mrs muggins and so anne had been suffered to remain noel took her off to the life he would tie up his face with a whistle of flannel and sit hugging the cat for ten minutes at a time was it a poor dee leddy then and did she want the poor little chickabiddies anne would choke with suppressed laughter when she came in to lay the table 
ain't it natural miss mollie and it is just what i did say to mrs muggins mollie was studying the chrysanthemum pensively when annie put her head in again the fire must not get low miss mollie because of the cake then mollie jumped up in dismay anne was going out and leaving that precious cake noel's birthday cake and it was such a nice one she had made it herself and it had beautiful pink and white icing on the top that her cake should be spoilt was a thought not to be endured for a moment she knew what anne's fires were black smoky concerns as mollie rushed into the kitchen the front door bell rang and anne with her hat on admitted a visitor a gentleman miss mollie and i have shown him up in the studio but mollie whose face was in the oven did not hear this her whole attention was absorbed by her cake menu cards were forgotten she stirred the fire put on coals and then sat down on the rug to watch the oven meanwhile the visitor walked briskly into the studio he was a small dark man and his dress was somewhat bohemian he had a brown velveteen coat and a yellow rose in his buttonhole and he had bright clear eyes that saw everything worth seeing and a good deal that ordinary folk failed to see not that people always found this out he had plenty of time for observation and when he had grown a little weary of his solitude he made a tour of the room he stood for some time by mollie's painting-table the menu-cards struck him as very pretty and graceful in their design my good little samaritan is artistic i see he said to himself but there was no need for her to put on her best frock because a stranger called but vanity and women are synonymous terms and after this atrocious sentiment which all women would utterly repudiate he looked curiously at a framed picture standing on the floor canute and his courtiers yes i see rather stale that sort of thing canute decidedly wooden ambitious but amateurish wants force and expression and then he shook his head hello what have we here and he stepped up to the easel it was a roughly executed sketch in crayon and was evidently a boy's work but in spite of considerable crudeness it was not without spirit a young lady was stepping down from an omnibus and a queer little man in a peaked hat and a huge moustache was handing her out he was grinning from ear to ear and in his other hand was a sixpence your eternally obliged monsieur blackie was written under the picture the visitor seemed puzzled then a light dawned finally he threw back his head and laughed aloud we have a humorist here he said to himself and to restore his gravity he began walking up and down the room but every time he passed the easel he laughed again this is clearly not my little samaritan he said to himself he had brought in a beautiful bouquet and had laid it down on the round table every few minutes he took it up and looked at the door the household was certainly a peculiar one an extraordinary young female with her face tied up in flannel had shown him upstairs after telling him that miss ward was in he had been waiting nearly twenty minutes should he ring the bell but there was no bell not a semblance of one then he thought he would leave the flowers and the sixpence with his card yes perhaps that would be best and then he hesitated it was very absurd but he rather wanted to see the little girl again there was something so bright and piquant about her perhaps she was keeping out of the way on purpose perhaps monsieur blackie and here he laughed afresh was not to her taste no sooner did this idea come into his head than with manlike perversity he determined to persevere he walked downstairs and into the dining-room here fresh amusement awaited him in the inscription noel ward his study my friend the humorist again he said softly and then he pricked up his ears for in some back premises he could distinctly hear a very clear sweet girlish voice he stole into the passage to listen and this is what he heard here's to the maiden of bashful fifteen here's to the widow of fifty here's to the flaunting extravagant queen and here's to the housewife that's thrifty let the toast pass drink to the lass 
i'll warrant she prove an excuse for the glass school for scandal muttered the stranger a very good song and very well sung i should like to clap let me see this is what they used to do in the arabian nights entertainment clap hands enter beautiful sir cassian slave with a golden dish full of jewelled fruits i will knock instead at the mysterious portal oh is that you anne exclaimed a voice cheerfully however did you get in fetch me some coals please and oh i forgot your poor tooth was it very bad pardon me observed the young man hurriedly then at the strange voice molly turned round once many years ago in a foreign gallery ingram had stood for a long time before a little picture that had captivated his fancy it was the work of an english artist and a very promising one and was entitled cinderella a little workhouse drudge was sitting on a stool in the chimney corner of a dark underground kitchen a black cindery fire was casting a dull glow a thin tabby cat was trying to warm itself the torn draggle frock and grimy hands of the little maid of all work were admirably rendered but under the tangled locks a pair of innocent child's eyes looked wistfully out a story-book with the page opened at cinderella lay on the lap ingram thought of this picture as molly turned her head and looked at him and man of the world as he was for the moment words failed him he was standing in a dull little kitchen a mere slip of a place looking out on a long straggling garden very narrow and chiefly remarkable for gooseberry and currant bushes and sitting on the rug in front of the fire like a blissful salamander was a girl with the most beautiful face that he had ever seen then poor molly blushing like a whole garden of full of roses in her embarrassment scrambled awkwardly to her feet oh dear i thought it was our anne will you tell me your name please father is out and we do not expect him home until eight my business was with your sister returned ingram regaining his self-possession as he saw the girl's nervousness your servant let me in exactly five-and-twenty minutes ago and as i thought the household was asleep i was endeavouring to discover a bell and then i heard singing let the toast pass drink to the lass awfully good song that oh dear faltered molly she would have liked to sink through the floor at that moment to avoid that bright quizzical glance that was father's song not mine oh i know now who you are you are the gentleman whose pocket was picked yesterday exactly monsieur blackie at your service and then molly turned cold with dismay and had let him in and he had been in the studio and noel's absurd sketch was on the easel he had recognized himself and molly's confusion and misery were so great that in another minute she would have disgraced herself for ever by bursting into tears only ingram fearing he had taken too great a liberty hastened to explain matters you see miss ward i was anxious to pay my debts and thank your sister if i remember rightly i told her that i should call oh yes at least waveney was not sure that you would and she had to go out i should like to have seen her perhaps another time you will allow me ingram reddened and hesitated she may not be long she has gone to berkeley square on business ah as the bell rang that is anne so please will you go upstairs molly was not quite equal to the situation she wanted to get rid of monsieur blackie but he did not seem inclined to go and ingram took a mean advantage of her inexperience i have left my hat upstairs he said hypocritically and there are some flowers which i brought for your sister and i think they ought to be put in water this appealed at once to molly oh certainly she said and as she limped down the passage before him a pained look came in ingram's eyes oh 
what a grievous pity he thought that lovely face to be allied with such a cruel infirmity oh what flowers exclaimed molly burying her face in them and then she glanced at the card shyly moritz ingram what a nice name yes he was rather nice too in spite of his droll looks she liked his voice but all the same if he would only go he ought to go and ingram evidently shared this opinion for he was hunting sedulously for his hat and as his efforts were unavailing molly was obliged to go to his help i brought it upstairs he kept saying manners make ye man and i was always remarkable for my good manners why even your sister took me for a frenchman and at this molly broke into a merry laugh and ingram's eyes twinkled sympathetically the next minute the door-bell rang again and molly who had just discovered the hat underneath the sofa though how it got there no one knew was just going to dart to the door when a cracked voice called out cat's meat and the faint mewing of mrs muggins was clearly audible in the distance and then noel strolled in he looked at ingram in unfeigned amazement then being an acute lad he grinned noel this is mr ingram the gentleman waveney saw in the omnibus yesterday i recognise myself returned ingram with an airy wave of the hand towards the picture though perhaps it is not a speaking likeness a sort of cross between mephistopheles and daniel quilp with perhaps a soupcon of the artful dodger i prefer to sit for my own portrait don't you know then noel grinned again rather sheepishly for once he was reaping the just reward of his impudence you are humorous my young friend continued ingram blandly i am an idealist all my life and i am exactly thirty-seven i have been seeking the impossible she that does not mean interrupting himself as though he feared to be misunderstood any individual woman oh dear no originality is my favourite fetish molly looked bewildered but she was rather impressed by this fine flow of words but noel's eyes brightened was this not a man and a brother women don't understand that sort of thing he observed confidentially they never laugh at the right jokes unless you label them and here noel threw up his head and cocked his chin that is why i have taken to drawing a picture pleases the poor things and the funnier you make it the more they like it indeed remarked ingram mildly and then he looked at the handsome lad with unfeigned approval it is for your sister's benefit that you do these clever sketches i am an artist myself an embryo artist i ought to say for i have never sold a picture but i recognize a brother in the art then noel who detected irony in the smooth voice looked a little sulky it is not clever a bit he growled it is beastly rot i did it to get a rise out of waveney waveney is the other one you know did you say waveney i never recollect hearing the name before no it is a queer sort of name father had a great aunt waveney when i want something short and handy don't you know i call her storm and stress upon my word miss ward your brother is perfectly dangerous if i stay here any longer i shall take the infection i told you my special and particular fetish was originality i seem to have met it here thank you as molly meekly handed him his hat i have trespassed on your kind hospitality far too long already with your kind permission i will call again in the hope of seeing your sister what could i say asked molly anxiously when she related the account of the afternoon the sisters were safely shut up in their own room a large front room over the studio mr ward slept in the little room behind i could not say no please do not come i am sure waveney does not want to see you why no of course not you did quite right molly dear did not dad say he showed his gratitude in a very gentlemanly way and as for noel he has been talking about him all the evening yes noel took a fancy to him and wave i do think he must be nice he says droll things in a soft sleepy sort of voice 
and i am afraid i was rather stupid and did not always understand but his eyes looked kind and gentle i was not afraid of him after the first few minutes poor little moll well it was rather embarrassing to have to interview a live stranger all alone and in the kitchen too for molly had drawn a highly coloured and graphic description of her first meeting with monsieur blackie waveney had laughed mercilessly at first molly ward enacting the part of cinderella or cinder maiden enter the black prince with the glass slipper molly dear i grieve to say it but your feet are not as pretty as mine and waveney who was excited with her eventful day kicked off her shoes and began dancing in the moonlight her tiny feet scarcely touching the floor and behold the spirit of mischief was in her for as molly sat on the bed and watched her with admiring eyes she suddenly broke into a song and this is what she sang here's to the maiden of bashful fifteen here's to the widow of fifty here's to the flaunting extravagant queen and here's to the housewife that's thrifty let the toast pass drink to the lass i'll warrant she'll prove an excuse for the glass End of chapter seven chapter eight of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org molly's prince by rosa newshet carey chapter eight molly's baby house within tis all divinely fair no care can enter my retreat tis but a castle in the air but you and i are in it sweet helen marion fernside it is necessary to retrace our steps a little for it was not until much later that waveney executed her pas de soeur in the moonlight miss harford had kept her word and waveney was deposited at sloane street station punctually at seven and before the quarter had struck she was walking quickly up cleveland terrace molly whose state of mind by this time baffled description was on the balcony watching for her and had the door opened before waveney was at the gate a few hurried questions and answers had been interchanged and then they had heard their father's latch-key in the door oh dear oh dear why is father so dreadfully early this evening exclaimed molly in a lamentable voice never mind returned waveney philosophically we must just wait until bedtime and then won't we make a night of it moll but father will hear us and rap on the wall observed molly fretfully and tell us to go to sleep like good children oh no he won't if we curl ourselves on the window-seat it is a big room and our voices won't reach him molly dear remember nothing is to be said to father to-night he is far too tired for fresh worries to-morrow i will take him for a prowl and talk to him severely no as molly looked at her wistfully i must have him all to myself i can manage him more easily so run down to him now dear while i take off my hat and then i will join you molly did as she was told and thanks to waveney's management they had another merry evening monsieur blackie was the leading topic waveney was quite touched when molly handed her the bouquet with a little speech but noel entirely spoilt it by croaking out in an absurd voice you're much and eternally obliged monsieur blackie hold your tongue you young rascal returned mr ward in high good humour mr ingram is a gentleman and shows that he knows what good manners are manners make man observed molly slyly and then noel exploded again he was the coolest hand i ever knew he replied if he were his grace the duke of wellington he could not have lorded it better you are a humorist my young friend i should like to have given him one for his impudence and then the cheek of telling the wobbly one that he would call again mr ward frowned 
no i will not have you call mollie by that name a jest is a jest but it must not be carried too far peg-top then returned noel unabashed by this rebuke for behind his father's back he winked at mollie but he was not a bad sort of chap he would be rather useful on an east windy dismal sort of a day he would make you feel cheerful i like a fellow who can take a joke without turning rusty over it and from noel this was high praise mollie thought the evening dreadfully long and she fidgeted so much and looked at the clock so often that her father called her drowsy head and begged her to go to bed but this made her redden with confusion and then when they were safe in their room waveney chose to be ridiculous and cut capers but as soon as her little song was finished she produced an old shepherd's plaid rug which was known in family annals as the lamb and they both crept under it and tucked up their feet on the window-seat and felt cosy and if an artist could have drawn the picture it would have made his fortune for the rough old plaid set off mollie's exquisite face and glorious golden-brown hair to perfection while waveney's looked fair and infantine in the moonlight waveney was the talker now and mollie was the listener but every now and then there were little interjections of surprise and admiration at the description of fairy magnificent mollie drew in her breath and said oh miss harford's ugliness rather shocked her she said it was a great pity and waveney had never been used to live with ugly people which was perfectly true she thought queen elizabeth's wraith a rather far-fetched description she could not endure queen bess she was such an unladylike person and boxed gentlemen's ears and if miss althea were like her but here waveney interposed don't be a little goose moll she is like queen elizabeth and you would say the same yourself if you saw her but she is so nice and gentle that i am sure i shall soon love her well let me go on i want to tell you about the red house then mollie sighed with satisfaction and composed herself to listen mollie with all her sweetness and goodness was a little sybarite at heart she loved pretty things fine house gems beautiful dresses mr ward had been almost shocked when he had taken her one day to bond street to look at the shops it was impossible to get her away from the jewellers the diamond tiaras and necklets riveted her who buys them dad she had asked in quite a loud voice dukes and earls and those sort of people yes of course returned mr ward a little impatiently and the prince of wales i dare say for he was rather provoked at the attention the child was exciting two gentlemen who were passing and had overheard mollie's remarks smiled at each other what a beautiful child observed one he was a tall old man with a fine benevolent face you are right duke returned the other with a supercilious laugh some little rustic come to town for the first time come mollie observed her father rather crossly we must not take up the pavement in this way or the bobby will be telling us to move on and then mollie had limped on until another shop window attracted her mr ward had felt a little perplexed by mollie's insatiable appetite for pretty things and on their return home he unbosomed himself to waveney all girls like shops he said seriously and i knew mollie would be pleased but i never expected her to glue her face to the glass for half an hour at a time she made herself quite conspicuous and several people laughed at her mollie must be better behaved next time returned waveney smiling father dear i don't think it matters really mollie is young and she leads such a quiet life and sees so few things that when she goes out she just loses her head i think she continued calmly that she does care for pretty things more than most people she would love to be rich and dress grandly and have pictures and jewels and beautiful things when we were tiny children she always would make me read the story of cinderella nothing else pleased her don't you care for pretty things too waveney asked her father a little sadly oh yes dad all girls care a little i think but i am not always longing for them like mollie she makes up stories to amuse herself 
some one is to leave us a fortune and we are all to be rich suddenly she has actually imagined a house and fitted it up bit by bit and just for the fun of the thing i have helped her it is our playhouse you know but molly thinks it quite real if you say to her let us go down to kit lands her eyes brighten and she looks quite happy you are foolish children observed mr ward fondly who would have thought that my sweet moll had been such a little worldling at heart no dad you must not say that worldly people are selfish and molly has not a selfish thought it is just a pretty childish fancy i sometimes believe in kitlands myself we have talked about it so often on windy nights i have seen the oaks tossing their branches in the park and the deer huddling under them and the west room where we always sit of an evening with the bay window and how the red firelight streams out on the terrace and there is a delicious couch by the fire with a lovely japanese screen behind it and but here mr ward put his hand over the girl's mouth do you think i am going to be entertained by a description of your baby house he said in mock wrath tell molly she ought to be grown up by this time but when he was left alone he said to himself now why in the world should they have hit on that name kitlands don't i recollect that sunny evening when i walked up the terrace and the red light streamed from the west room he sighed then roused himself bless their dear innocent hearts now if only their mother could have heard all that molly was perfectly ravished with the description of the red house and as soon as waveney paused to take breath she said why it is almost as nice as kitlands only there is no park and no deer but i wish i had thought of a peacock then she put her head on one side and reflected deeply there is the italian garden you know wave a sundial would do very nicely there and we could choose an inscription but waveney gave her a little push don't be such a baby molly we are getting too old for kitlands we must put our playhouse away with the dear old dolls but seriously is it not perfectly delicious to think we shall be together every sunday yes that will be nice of course but is it really settled wave and molly's voice was full of melancholy i think so dear but of course i must talk to father darling promise me that you will try and make the best of it the week will pass so quickly and then when sunday comes we shall be together i dare say i shall be with you by half-past three just after father and noel have started for their afternoon walk i shall come to the station and meet you interrupted molly will you how nice that will be and we shall have a cosy hour on grumps and you shall tell me all your worries every one of them and i will tell mine then when father comes in you and noel shall get tea ready and dad and i will have a little talk and after tea we will sing all our favourite hymns and then we will go to st michael's together and i will have my old place by father yes and then we will all go to the station with you but oh wave how shall i hate monday mornings i shall never feel cheerful until wednesday is over but waveney would not hear of this she preached quite a little homily on the duty of cultivating cheerfulness but her eloquence died a natural death when she saw molly nod and ten minutes later they were both asleep it was a free morning with mr ward and he was not at all surprised when waveney invited him to take a prowl won't molly prowl too he asked as he noticed her wistful expression but waveney shook her head molly was an idle girl yesterday she remarked severely she must stay in and finish her menu card there you shall have the black prince's flowers to console you and waveney placed them on the painting-table sweets to the sweet they are as much yours as mine molly then molly blushed a little guiltily more than once the thought had passed through her mind how nice it would be if she had a monsieur blackie to bring her hot-house flowers for molly was very human and certainly a creature not too bright and good for human nature's daily food and she had her girlish weaknesses not that she envied waveney her flowers but as she sniffed them delightedly her imagination conjured up numberless bouquets for miss molly ward only the donor must be tall and fair not a little dark frenchified artist like monsieur blackie waveney chatted to her father quite gaily until they had crossed the lime avenue and had reached the landing stage then they walked a little way down the embankment and sat down on a bench under a shady tree 
it was still early and there were few passengers only now and then a river steamer passed churning the blue water into light foamy waves two or three children were bowling their hoops followed by a panting pug waveney cleared her voice rather nervously then she slid her hand into her father's arm everard could see the worn little glove fingers on his coat sleeve he stared at the white seams dreamily as he listened he was a man who noticed trifles there was a feminine element in his character that little shabby grey glove appealed to him forcibly father dear i have something to tell you that is why i did not want mollie to come it is so much easier to talk about difficult things to only one person waveney's voice was not as clear as usual will you promise to listen dearest without interrupting me mr ward nodded but his face was a little grave what could the child have to say waveney told her story very fully she gave her father a description of the red house and fairy magnificent but she never mentioned miss harford's name she spoke of them vaguely as the ladies and you have settled all this without speaking to me and there was a hurt look on mr ward's face then waveney nestled closer to him father dear i wanted to tell you i want to tell you everything but you were so tired and i thought it would be kinder to wait until i had spoken to the ladies the ladies what ladies have they no name he asked irritably yes dear of course they have returned the girl gently their name is harford then he turned round a little quickly harford oh i dare say there are plenty of that name i know erpingham noel and i walked there one sunday afternoon but i do not remember the red house no it stands in a lane you have to go through some white gates they have not always been at erpingham they used to live in surrey then she felt him start slightly i suppose you did not hear their christian names he asked a little anxiously oh yes dad i did the ugly one she was very nice but she is terribly plain was called doreen and the pale fair one like queen elizabeth was althea then it was evident that mr ward was completely taken aback doreen and althea he muttered it must be the same with what a singular coincidence waveney my child tell me one thing was the name of the house in surrey kitlands i don't know father they never told me but stay a moment there was a picture in miss harford's sitting-room of an old elizabethan house standing in a park and under it was written kitlands park i meant to tell mollie about that it is the same it must be the same he returned in a low voice the names are too uncommon yes and it is true althea was a little like queen elizabeth i would have given five years of my life that this had not happened it is one of the little ironies of fate that my girl should have gone to them oh why father asked waveney piteously her father's look of bitterness filled her with dismay why was he so disturbed so unlike himself he did not even hear her question he got up from the bench quickly and walked to the railings another steamer was passing mr ward looked after it with vague unseeing eyes everard ward was a proud man in spite of his easy-going ways he had had his ambitions his aspirations and yearnings he had set his ideal high and yet for want of ballast he had suffered shameful shipwreck at the beginning of life he had had his good things health good looks talents and friends doors had opened to him kindly hands had been held out to him and one of them a woman's hand but he had turned away in youthful caprice and had chosen his own path he had meant to have carved his own fortunes to have painted pictures that would have made the name of everard ward famous and he was only a drawing-master who painted little third-rate pot-boilers how everard loathed his poverty his shabby coat and molly's pitiful little makeshifts and contrivances were all alike hateful to him too well he remembered the flesh-pots of egypt the goshen of his youth where he had fared sumptuously when he had money to spend and the world smiled at him and then like a fool the very prince of fools he had flung it all away he had made a mess of his life but he was not without his blessings and in his better moments when the children were singing their hymns perhaps he would tell himself humbly that he was not worthy of them but as he stood by the river that morning it seemed to him as though the cup of his humiliation was full to the very dregs he had so broken with his old life that few ghostly visitants from the dim past troubled him and now there had started up in his path the two women whom he most dreaded to see 
and one of them he had wronged when hot with a young man's passion and tempted by dorothy's sweet eyes and girlish grace he had drawn back suddenly and selfishly from the woman he had been wooing well he had dearly loved his wife but the disgrace of that shameful infidelity was never effaced from his memory it was a blot a stain upon his manhood a sore spot that often made him wince would he ever forget that day they were in the old walled garden gathering peaches and althea had just handed him one hot with the sun and crimson tinted and bursting with sweetness you always give me the best of everything althea he had said but he was thinking of dorothy as he said it and of her love for peaches i like to give you the best the very best althea had answered sweetly and her eyes had been so wistful and tender that he had felt vaguely alarmed how he had made his meaning clear to her he never could remember he had spoken of dorothy and perhaps his voice had trembled for all at once she had become very silent and there was no more gathering of peaches i must go in now she had said suddenly and he noticed her lips were pale doreen wants me yes i understand everard and you have my best wishes my best wishes and then he had stood still and watched her a tall slim figure in white moving between the fruit trees and carrying her head proudly and it is to althea harford that my daughter has applied for a situation thought everard sadly and again he told himself that he was draining the cup of humiliation to the very dregs End of chapter eight chapter nine of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org molly's prince by rosa newshet carey chapter nine rosalind and celia a hero worshipped and throned high on the heights of a sweet romance a faithful friend who was always the same till the clouds grew heavy and troubles came but this is life and this is to live and this is the way of the world gertrude carey waveney sat on the bench feeling very forlorn and deserted until her father came back to her he had evidently pulled himself together for he looked at her with his old kind smile though perhaps his lips were not quite steady come little girl don't fret he said tenderly least said is soonest mended and we must just go through with it but father are you sure you do not mind she returned eagerly we are very poor but i would rather please you dear than have ever so much money you know that do you not waveney's eyes were full of tears and her little hands clasped his arm appealingly mr ward's laugh was a trifle husky i know i have two good children he returned feelingly look here my child things have got a little mixed and complicated and i find it difficult to explain matters it is my poverty and not my will consents don't you know and we must just pocket our pride and put a good face on it do you mean that i am to go to miss harford are you very sure that you mean that dad yes certainly but his face clouded did you not tell me that miss althea suffered with her eyes and needed a reader and companion we were good friends once so why should i put an affront on her by refusing her my daughter's services waveney sighed she felt a little oppressed her father took a reasonable and practical view of the case but his voice was constrained he was a proud man and at times he chafed sadly at his limitations he could not forget that he had come of a good old stock he used to tell his girls to carry their heads high and not allow themselves to be shunted by nobodies your mother was a gentlewoman he would say and your great-grandmother had the finest manners i ever saw she was a markham of 
maplethorpe and drove in a chariot and four horses when she went to the county ball it was your grandfather who ruined us all he speculated in mines and so maplethorpe was sold i saw it once when i was a little chap i remember playing on the bowling green everard ward thought he was doing his duty in teaching his girls to consider themselves superior to their neighbours but sometimes waveney would joke about it she would come into the room with her little nose tip tilted and her head erect and cross her mittened hands over her bosom am i like my great-grandmother markham she would say stand back molly i am going to dance the minuet and then waveney would solemnly lift her skirts and point her tiny foot and her little performance would be so artless and full of grace that mr ward would sit in his chair quite riveted father i wish you would tell me how you first came to know the misses harford asked waveney rather timidly mr ward had relapsed into silence but he roused himself at the question it was in my oxford days child i was quite a young fellow then there were a good many pleasant houses where i visited but there was none i liked so well as kitlands mrs harford was alive then she was rather an invalid but we all liked her i always got on with elderly women they said i understood their little ways i knew your fairy magnificent too she was a great beauty we young fellows used to wonder why she had never married again oh father this is very interesting my good little fairy magnificent then he nodded and smiled when mrs mainwaring came down to kitlands there would be all sorts of gaieties going on riding parties and archery meetings in the summer and dances and theatricals in the winter once we acted a pastoral play in the park as you like it it was very successful and the proceeds went to the county hospital i remember i was orlando was miss althea rosalind no your mother was rosalind she acted the part charmingly it was her first and last appearance althea his voice changed was celia her sister doreen insisted on being audrey because she said she looked the part to perfection then mother knew them too observed waveney in surprise well no dear one could hardly say that we were in great distress for rosalind and the williams heard of our difficulty and they said they knew a young lady who had studied the part for some private theatricals that had never come off i had already met your mother at the county ball and i was very glad to see her again rosalind he laughed a little and orlando clenched the business but father why have you dropped such nice friends it was evident that mr ward had expected this question and was prepared for it well you see my child when i married your dear mother i was supposed by my friends to have done a foolish thing it was difficult enough to hold our heads above water without trying to keep in the swim people quietly dropped us as we dropped them it is the way of the world little girl and then in a would-be careless tone he quoted a part played out and the play not o'er and the empty years to come with darkening clouds beyond and above and a helpless groping for truth and love but this is life and this is love and this is the way of the world it was a habit of mr ward's to quote poetry he often read it to his children he had a clear musical voice but waveney was not content to have the subject so summarily dismissed father dear do you really mean to say that the harfords gave you up because you were poor and her tone was a little severe no dear it was i who gave them up by the by waveney i wonder why they left kitlands and as the girl shook her head he continued thoughtfully it was a big place and perhaps they did not care to keep it up after their mother's death they always wanted to live near a town well have we finished our talk and then waveney rose reluctantly 
he had not told her much she thought regretfully but all the same her girlish intuition went very nearly the truth there was something underneath something that concerned miss althea why had her father looked so pained when she had mentioned the name but with a delicacy that did her honour she was careful not to drop a hint of her suspicions to molly mr ward thought he had kept his secret well he was impulsive and reckless by nature but his care for his motherless girls was almost feminine in its tenderness they were too precious for the rough workaday world so he tried to hedge them in with all kind of sweet old obsolete fashions for fear a breath should soil their crystalline purity father would like to wrap us up in lavender and put us under a glass case waveney would say laughingly and it must be owned that neither she nor molly were quite up to date they did not talk slang they were not blase and they had fresh natural ideas on every subject which they would express freely waveney was the most advanced molly was still a simple child in spite of her nineteen years molly was very curious on the subject of her father's intimacy with the harfords but waveney managed to satisfy her without making any fresh mysteries it is all in a nutshell molly she said quietly when father was a young man he went to a lot of nice houses and kitlands was one of them they were rich people and very gay and gave grand parties and he had quite a good time of it and then he and mother married and they were poor and then somehow all their fine friends dropped off oh what a shame interrupted molly indignantly well the harfords did not drop him but somehow he left off going there and he has never even heard of them for twenty years i think it upset him rather to have his old life brought up before him so suddenly it made him feel the difference don't you see and waveney's voice was a little sad she could so thoroughly enter into her father's feelings what a change from the light-hearted young man of fashion acting orlando and making love to rosalind in the green glades of kitlands to the shabby drudging drawing-master with shoulders already bowed with continual stooping waveney wrote her little note of acceptance the next day it brought a kind answer from miss althea she was very glad that miss ward had decided to come to them she and her sister would do their best to make her feel at home erpingham was so near and they so often drove into town that she could see her people constantly please give our kind remembrances to your father if he has not quite forgotten his old friends was the concluding sentence waveney handed the note silently to her father he reddened over the closing words what a kind womanly letter it was the faint smell of lavender with which it was perfumed was not more fragrant than the warm-hearted generosity that had long ago forgiven the slight had he really wounded her by his desertion or had her vanity merely suffered how often he had asked himself this question they had only met once a week before his wedding and she had been very gentle with him asking after dorothy with a friendliness that had surprised him for a man like he never guessed how even a good woman will on occasion play the hypocrite she is a kind creature he said giving back the letter but his manner was so grave that even molly did not venture to say a word the girls had a good deal on their minds just then waveney's scanty wardrobe had been reviewed and molly had actually wept tears of humiliation over its deficiencies oh wave what will you do she said sorrowfully and we dare not ask father for more than a few shillings no of course not but waveney's forehead was lined with care as she sat silently revolving possibilities and impossibilities what would the mrs harford think of her shabby old trunk that had once belonged to her mother then she threw back her curly head and looked at molly resolutely molly don't be silly life is not long enough for fretting over trifles the mrs harford know we are poor so they will not expect smart frocks 
i have my grey cashmere for sundays and i must wear my old serge for every day i will get fresh trimming for my hat and a new pair of gloves and and boots ejaculated molly you shall have a pair of boots if i go barefoot all the winter and your shoes are very shabby too wave yes i know i will talk to father and see what is to be done if he would advance me a couple of pounds i could repay it at christmas is it not a blessing that i have one tidy gown for evenings for some three months before they had gone to some smart school party and their father being flush of money just then had bought them some simple evening dresses the material was only cream-coloured nuns veiling but molly had looked so lovely in her white gown that all the girls had been wild with envy the dresses had only been worn once since and as waveney remarked were just as good as new shall you wear it every evening wave molly had asked in an awed tone and when waveney returned why of course you silly child i have no other frock in big houses people always dress nicely for dinner i found that out at mrs addison's molly regarded the matter as quite decided her oracle had spoken mr ward had advanced the two pounds without any demur and the sisters made their modest purchases the following afternoon as waveney was retrimming her hat and molly painting her menu cards and flung open the door somewhat noisily mr inkpen miss she announced in a loud voice and the next minute monsieur blackie entered he looked trim and alert as usual his face beamed when he saw waveney it is the right miss ward this time he said shaking hands with her cordially then he looked at molly and his manner changed will you allow your maid to hang these birds up in your larder and he held out a superb brace of pheasants to the bewildered girl molly grew crimson with shyness and delight do you mean they are for us she faltered yes for you and your sister and your father and my young friend the humorist and please remember and now his smile became more ingratiating that they are from m blackie no please do not thank me they were shot by a friend of mine i rather object to the massacre of the innocents myself and i prefer doing it by deputy by the by i find i have a new name your maid is a humorist too inkpen there is something charmingly original and suggestive about that it makes ingram rather commonplace oh i think you have such a beautiful name returned molly artlessly it is ever so much better than ward then waveney nudged her i think the pheasants ought to be hung up she said rather brusquely and at this broad hint molly limped off with very pink cheeks whatever made you say that molly was her comment afterwards i don't think it is quite nice to tell gentlemen that they have beautiful names i am sure i saw an amused look on mr ingram's face but molly only looked puzzled at this anne is very stupid about names remarked waveney as she took up her work again she always calls me miss waverley and noel master noel somehow she does not seem to grasp sounds was your sister christened molly he asked quickly and he looked at the menu cards as he spoke yes it was mother's fancy and i do so love the name returned waveney in a frank way i dare say you would not guess it people seldom do but we are twins strangers always think molly is the elder i should have thought so myself returned ingram and then he took up one of the cards waveney thought he was a little nervous his manner was so grave these are very pretty he said quietly i thought so the other day the design is charming may i ask if your sister ever takes orders for them yes indeed a lady has commissioned molly to paint these she is to have twelve shillings for the set twelve shillings and here ingram's voice was quite indignant miss ward he continued turning round to molly who had just re-entered the room it is a shame that you should be so fleeced why the design is worth double that sum now there is a friend of mine who would willingly give you two guineas for a set of six she is very artistic and fond of pretty things and if you are willing to undertake the commission i will write to her to-morrow willing molly's eyes were shining with pleasure if she could only earn the two guineas they should furnish sop for cerberus alias barker waveney's earnings would not be due until christmas and the constant nagging of the aggrieved butcher was making anne's life miserable 
master says if meat's wanted it must be paid for and he does not hold with cheap cuts and long reckonings drat the man i hates the very sight of him remarked Dan wrathfully to her usual confidant mrs muggins for with toothache a swollen face and an irascible butcher life was certainly not worth living then i will write to my to the lady to-morrow both molly and waveney noticed the little slip i wonder if he is married waveney said to herself but molly's inward comment was very likely mr ingram is engaged but he does not know us well enough to tell us so mr ingram was trying to regain his airy manner but a close observer would have detected how keenly he was watching the two girls as he talked nothing escaped him the new hat trimmings and the faded hat waveney's worn little shoe and the white seams and molly's blue serge cinderella he always called her cinderella to himself was no whit smarter than she had been the other day her hair was rather rough as though the wind had loosened it and yet with what ease and sprightliness they chattered to him their refined voices their piquant girlish ways free from all self-consciousness delighted the young man who had travelled all over the world and had not found anything so simple and artless and real as these two girls it was waveney to whom he directed his conversation and with whom he carried on his gay badinage but when he spoke to molly his voice seemed to soften unconsciously as though he were speaking to a child End of chapter nine chapter ten of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org molly's prince by rosa nuchette carey chapter ten it is the voice of sheila in the grey old chapel cloister i sit and muse alone till the dial's time-worn fingers mark the moment when we twain shall in paradisal sunlight walk together once again helen marion burnside there was no doubt that both waveney and molly found their guest amusing his views of life were so original and there was such a quiet vein of humour running through his talk that after a time little peals of girlish laughter reached anne's ears it was molly who first struck the keynote of discord mr ingram had been speaking of a celebrated singer whom he had heard in paris she is to sing at st james hall next saturday week he went on they say the place will be packed a friend of mine has some tickets at his bestowal if you and your sister would care to go as usual he addressed waveney but molly's face grew very long oh dear how nice it would have been she sighed but waveney is going away and her eyes filled with tears going away he echoed in surprise yes she is going to be a reader and companion to a lady living at erpingham and she will only come home on sundays and then a big tear rolled down molly's smooth cheek and dropped into her lap and we have never been apart for a single day she finished with a little sob dear molly hush whispered waveney we ought not to trouble mr ingram with our little worries erpingham is a nice place she continued trying to speak cheerfully do you know it oh yes he returned quickly most people know it there is a fine common and some golf links and there are some big houses there yes but the red house is in erpingham lane then mr ingram started i think some ladies of the name of harford live there he said carelessly two are very much given to good works oh do you know them asked waveney eagerly but it struck her that he evaded the question we have mutual friends he replied rather stiffly they are excellent women and do an immense amount of good they have a sort of home for broken-down governesses and they do a lot for shop-women i have an immense respect for people who do that sort of thing recovering his sprightliness 
i tried slumming once myself but i had to give it up it was not my vocation the boys called me guy fox and that hurt my feelings by the by as they both laughed at this i have never explained the purport of my visit i understood from your sister and here he looked at waveney that mr ward had a picture for sale king canute was it not well a friend of mine has a picture gallery and he is always buying pictures he wants to fill up a vacant place in an alcove and he suggested some early english historical subject he has an alfred toasting the cakes in the swineherd's cottage and a saint augustine looking at the saxon slaves in the market-place and it struck me that king canute would be an excellent subject what lots of friends you seem to have remarked molly innocently there is the one who shoots pheasant and the one who buys menu cards and now another who buys pictures ingram looked a little embarrassed but he was amused too one can't knock about the world without making friends he said lightly do you recollect what apollinarius says for i am the only one of my friends i rely on but the chinese have a better maxim still there are plenty of acquaintances in the world but very few real friends is the picture friend only an acquaintance asked molly rather provokingly no indeed returned ingram energetically we are like brothers he and i and i have known him all my life well miss molly do you think your father would be willing to let my friend have king canute it is a famous subject and brings back the memories of one's school days and then he walked to the picture and stood before it as though he were fascinated but in reality he was saying to himself now what am i to offer for this very mawkish and stilted performance and the question was so perplexing that he fell into a brown study molly looked at her sister she was brimful of excitement but waveney shook her head would it not be better for your friend to see the picture first she said in a cool business-like tone but inwardly she was just as excited as molly ten pounds would pay all they owe to barber and chandler would wait i am sure that father would be pleased to see any one who cared to look at the picture she finished boldly mr ingram regarded her pleasantly you are very good but there is not the slightest occasion to trouble you i am my friend's agent in this sort of thing i have been abroad a good deal and have served my apprenticeship to art i am an art critic don't you know now would you mind telling me miss ward how much your father expected to get from the dealers i don't know returned waveney doubtfully there was no fixed price was there molly father told us that he would be content with ten pounds my dear miss ward returned ingram in a tone of strong remonstrance your father undervalues himself ten pounds for that work of art heaven forgive me all the fibs i am telling he added mentally and then he cleared his throat i am no jew and must decline to drive a hard bargain if mr ward will let my friend have king canute i shall be willing to pay on his behalf five and twenty pounds i mean looking calmly at the girl's agitated face five and twenty guineas they were too overwhelmed with surprise and pleasure to answer him and just at that moment that supreme moment they heard their father's latch-key ingram described the little scene later on to a dear friend it was atalanta's race don't you know they both wanted to reach their father first he was the golden apple pro tem the lame miss ward had long odds but my little friend of the omnibus beat her hollow can you fancy titania coming down her ladder of cobwebs well you should see miss ward number two running downstairs it would give you a notion of it and there was the golden apple on the doormat waiting for her you are very absurd returned his hearer laughing but your description amuses me so please go on there is something very refreshing in such originality he murmured languidly i have an idea that gwen would love those girls 
gwen is all for nature and reality conventionality might have suggested that it was hardly mannerly to leave a guest in an empty room even for golden apples but no such idea would have occurred to the misses ward they even forgot that sound ascends and that i could hear every word dear me that was very awkward but the lady spoke maliciously i could hear every word he repeated and then his eyes twinkled but he was honourable enough not to repeat the little conversation father monsieur blackie is upstairs and here molly giggled his real name is ingram but anne calls him mr inkpen all right my pet so i suppose i'd better go upstairs but waveney pulled him back wait a moment father dear what a hurry you are in and your hair is so rough and your coat is dusty give me the brush molly we must put him tidy dad such a wonderful thing has happened mr ingram wants to buy king canute for a rich friend who has a picture gallery and he will pay you five and twenty guineas nonsense child but from his tone mr ward was becoming excited too let me pass molly you are forgetting your manners children leaving a visitor alone and everard ward marched into the studio with his head unusually high the golden apple alias ward pear was a shabby fair little man with a face like a greek god continued ingram he must have been a perfect adonis in his youth he had brown pathetic eyes rather like a spaniel's you know what i mean eyes that seemed always to be saying i am a good fellow though i am down on my luck and i should like to be friends with you it was evident that the two men took to each other at once ingram's pleasant manners and undisguised cordiality put mr ward at his ease and in a few minutes they were talking as though they were old friends the subject of king canute was soon brought forward again and ingram explained matters with a good deal of tact and finesse everard ward reddened and then he said bluntly you are very good mr ingram to offer me such a handsome price but sheer honesty compels me to say the picture is not worth more than ten pounds i have not worked out the subject as well as i could wish and then he added a little sadly it is a poor thing but my own my dear sir returned ingram airily we artists are bad critics of our own work my friends regard me as an optimist but i call myself an idealist i am a moral sisyphus for ever rolling my poor stone up the hill difficulty then as he noticed molly's puzzled look he continued blandly sisyphus was a fraudulent and avaricious king of corinth whose task in the world of shades is to roll a large stone to the top of a hill and fix it there the unpleasant part of the business is that the stone no sooner reaches the hilltop than it bounds down again excuse this lengthy description which reminds me a little of sandford and merton but revenons à nos moutons i am ready mr ward to take the picture for my friend at the price i mentioned to your daughters and as i have the money about me and here he produced a russian leather pocket-book i think we had better settle our business at once everard ward was only human and the bait was too tempting his conscience told him that the picture was a failure and hardly worth more than the cost of the frame and yet such is the vanity innate in man that he was willing to delude himself with the fancy that the stranger's eyes had detected merit in it and indeed ingram's manner would have deceived any one it is the very thing he wants for the alcove he murmured stepping back a few paces and regarding the picture through half-closed eyes the light will be just right and here he appeared to swallow something with difficulty the effect will be extremely good and then he began counting the crisp bank notes waveney's eyes began to sparkle and she and molly telegraphed little messages to each other not only the insolent barker would be paid but the much enduring chandler when mr ward went downstairs to open the door for his guest waveney threw her arm round her sister and dragged her down upon grumps 
oh molly i quite love that dear little monsieur blackie she cried enthusiastically think of ten whole pounds to spend father can have a new great coat and noel those boots he wants so dreadfully and you must have a new jacket i insist on it molly i shall do very well with my old one until christmas but molly would not hear this for a moment if any one had the new jacket it must be waveney what did it matter what a poor little cinderella wore at home and they both got so hot and excited over the generous conflict that mr ward thought they were quarrelling until he saw their faces i like that fellow he said rubbing his hands he is gentlemanly and agreeable he told me in confidence that though he calls himself an artist he only dabbles in art if a relative had not left me a nice little property i should long ago have been in queer street he said in his droll way oh then he is not poor as we are observed molly in a disappointed tone no he is certainly not poor returned her father laughing i should think he is tolerably well to do judging from appearances and certainly he has rich friends he has asked my permission to call again when he is in the neighbourhood and both the girls were pleased to hear this waveney had not seen her old friends at the hospital for more than a week so one morning she went across to wish them good-bye she had a little cake that molly had made for them and some tobacco that she had bought with her own money it was a wet day and most of the pensioners were in the big hall one of them told waveney that sergeant mcgill was in his cubicle with the corporal as usual in attendance they do say the sergeant's a bit poorly continued her informant and a moment afterwards she came upon corporal marks stumping along the corridor with a newspaper in his hand the little man looked dejected but he saluted waveney with his usual dignity i hear the sergeant is not well i trust it is nothing serious then the corporal shook his head and his blue eyes were a little watery well no miss ward not to say serious we are none of us chickens so to speak and we have most of us cut our wisdom teeth a good many years ago the sergeant has been poorly for a week now he is down in the mouth and i can't rouse him no how would you believe it miss ward i was trying to argify with him this morning about that there sepoy for it stands to reason mcgill i said to him that there could only be two of them and he fairly flew at me lost his temper and told me i was an infernal liar why you might have knocked me down with a feather i was so taken aback and the corporal's droll face was puckered up with care never mind corporal returned waveney soothingly mcgill was ill and not himself or he would not have been so irritable with his old comrade look here i've come to bid you all good-bye because i'm going away and my sister's made you one of those cakes you like and i've brought you some tobacco then the corporal's face cleared a little they found the old soldier lying on his bed with a rug over his feet his face looked drawn and pallid at the sound of waveney's light step he turned his sightless eyes towards her and a strange expression passed over his features there was only one step that was as light he murmured in his thick soft voice and that was sheila's and hers hardly brushed the dewdrops from the heather then as waveney took hold of his great hand and it was her small fingers too the brown little hands that carried the creel of peat and stacked it underneath the eaves and it is sheila that has come to me heaven bless her sweet face before i take the long journey my dear old friend do you not know me said waveney looking anxiously at him it is not sheila it is miss ward who has come to wish you good-bye then the old man looked bewildered and raised himself on the pillow and are you very well miss ward and it is i who have made the mistake like the old fool that i was it may be i was dreaming i was always clever at the dreams as the corporal knows but it seemed to me as though i could see the blue water of the lock and the grey walls of our cottage and the shingly roofs and even the cocks and hens pecking in the dust and there was sheila coming up from the beach with her bare feet and red kerchief tied over her dark hair and her smile was like sunshine and her hands were full of great scarlet poppies and if it was a dream it was a good dream was sheila your sister asked waveney softly for she knew that sergeant mcgill had never been married though the corporal was a widower then at the beloved name mcgill roused to complete consciousness no miss ward i had no sister only six brothers and sheila was the lass of my heart and when i had got my stripes we were to have married but it was my fate for when i came from the wars there was the lock and the purple moors and the grey walls of the cottage but sheila she would never come to meet me again with the poppies in her hand and the wild rose in her cheek she lay in the graveyard on the hillside where the dead 
can hear the bees humming in the heather but it is not the goot manners to be telling you of the old troubles and very soon it is sheila herself that i shall see tell miss ward the message that sheila left with her mother mcgill it was this that she said he continued in a proud tone you must bid fergus mcgill not to grieve he is a grand soldier and a good lad and dearly i would have loved to have been his wife but god's will be done tell him i will be near the gates and that if the angels permit that it is sheila who will be there to welcome him that message must have made you very happy returned waveney tenderly they were good words and i do not deny that they have given me comfort replied mcgill solemnly but for years i had a heavy heart for when a highlander loses the last of his heart the world is a barren place to him but it is the truth that sheila has spoken and it is herself that i shall see with these dim old eyes he sank back a little heavily on the pillows waveney leant over him and spoke gently in his ear mcgill she said in her clear girlish voice do you know you have hurt the poor corporal's feelings you were angry with him this morning and called him names then there was a flush of shame on the grand old face it was myself that was in fault miss ward for i lost my temper but it is not the corporal who will quarrel with his old comrade it was the liar that i called him but it was i who disgraced myself never mind old maid i was wrong to argify and so we are quits there for it stands to reason continued the corporal that when a man is poorly he is not in a condition for fighting still it was the bad manners to be calling any one a liar returned sergeant mcgill but a highlander's temper is not always under control so i ask your pardon marks but it was three sepoys that i killed with my own hand and i had the third by the throat dear sergeant interposed waveney softly corporal marks quite understands all that and what does it matter a little difference between two old friends then a strangely sweet smile lighted up the wrinkled old face it is the voice of sheila and what will she be saying again and again blessed are the peacemakers and they are grand words shall i read to you a little asked the girl timidly then the corporal took down an old testament from the shelf and waveney read slowly and reverently passage after passage until the heavy breathing told her that mcgill was asleep then she closed the book and went out into the corridor he is very ill she said sorrowfully so feeble and so unlike himself but the corporal refuted this stoutly mcgill is but poorly he returned so gruffly that waveney did not venture to say more when he has taken a bottle or two of the doctor's stuff he will pick up a bit he sleeps badly and that makes him drowsy and confused and then he saluted and stumped back to his comrade waveney heard a different story downstairs have you seen mcgill two or three said to her the poor chap he is breaking fast the corporal won't believe it but it is plain as a pike staff and so on molly dear observed waveney said i have such bad news to tell you dear old sergeant mcgill is very ill and i fear he is going to die and what will the corporal do without him and it is so strange she went on he thinks he is a lad again in his highland home and that his sweetheart sheila is coming to meet him he calls her the lass of his heart and it is all so poetical and beautiful and waveney's voice was so full of pathos that molly's eyes filled with sympathetic tears End of chapter ten